welcome back. Uh, in this lecture, we will talk about comprehensive mobility plans. So, the concepts covered in this particular lecture would be on comprehensive mobility plans, traffic analysis zones, comprehensive mobility plan tasks, travel demand analysis, the introduction to it and components of comprehensive mobility plan. So, uh, as we have discussed in the last lecture, the, the different kinds of plans are being prepared for urban areas. So, along with development plans, another important plan that is being that is prepared is the comprehensive mobility plan. And comprehensive mobility plans mostly deals with the transportation part of a development plan. But of course, it is not alone. It is done in an integrated with, way with transport, uh, land use and transportation development. So, the primary difference between our normal transportation plan and the comprehensive mobility plan, we can say that the comprehensive mobility plan is a long term vision document to improve mobility of people and goods in a city. So, we are talking about the mobility of as a this we have to improve mobility for a particular city. So, this is also designed to improve accessibility which influences urban land use patterns. That means, a, a, a comprehensive mobility plan or in short CMP, we can call it CMP in the subsequent uh, part of the lecture. So, CMP is actually allow, uh, are designed to improve accessibility. So, it is improving mobility and accessibility and accessibility as you have already been told is part of land use. That means, how we improve land uses, accessibility is a big part of it. So, it also improves strategy, provides strategies and investment programs to achieve this particular vision. So, CMP is not only the plan, but it also shows us how to achieve that and what kind of investment is required to achieve this kind of a plan. And then CMT is primarily promotes, there are certain lot of things CMT, CMT focuses on, but the few important, major important ones are improvement of public transport, pedestrian infrastructure and non-motorized transport facilities. And of course, land use and transport development is integrated in a seamless process in the comprehensive mobility plan. Some of the key points of a comprehensive mobility plan, these are equity, low carbon mobility and service level benchmarks. Now, equity as you understand is that means the plan should be equally, it should equally benefit all the residents of a city. So, this is equity and or rather all the stakeholders that are involved. And then it should target for low carbon mobility, which means that well the total amount of emission and the total amount of fuel use in the city should be reduced. And then service level benchmark actually refers to different standards. It may be public transit standards, it could be standards related with infrastructure. So, how to improve these standards for urban areas. So, a comprehensive mobility plan tries to improve different service level benchmarks for different aspects in an urban area while also targeting while maintaining equity as well as trying to achieve a low carbon mobility. So, the different contents of a CMP in short I would rather I would say uh, that uh, first the first task is to review the existing travel demand and land use of an urban area. Then we need to conduct a travel de transport demand survey or we can call it a travel demand survey as well. What it means is we need to ascertain what kind of traffic load is there in the different corridors, what kind of trips people make and so on and how many number of trips they make and what is the distance they travel, this kind of information is required. Then preparation of future land use scenarios means we need to understand how the city is growing. So, maybe this input may come from the development plans and then future transport network and other technological scenarios. That means future transportation network refers to maybe a new transit line may come into place or it may also refer to certain new modes that may come in the urban area and along with other technological changes which may influence the land use transportation process. So, once we have these basic data sets and targets, uh, I say targets because a future land use scenario is basically what we are trying to achieve, then we need to develop a transport demand forecast model and a network evaluation tool. That means, we need to prepare, uh, prepare a set of models or a, or, a, or a body of models which will actually be able to predict the future transport demand and also it will be able to predict what kind of effect it will have on the networks so that we can also 
predict or we can also decide on how we can improve the different networks by provision of either infrastructure or other kinds of alternatives. And then along with all this, we need to model carbon dioxide emissions and the amount of air pollution that is resulting from that and uh, from because of this from the transportation part and then the social and in environmental impact assessment of for this particular plan and finally preparation of implementation programs where we also take into consideration the stakeholders and we also take into them as part of the planning process and take their feedback in the different steps of the planning process. So this is largely what our CMP covers and how they are related with the existing plans. For example, with the development plan or master plan, uh, they, the, both the, you know, uh, they can act as both input and output of each other. That means uh, input in a CMP could come from the master plan. For example, the future land use scenarios or the kind of jobs that are going to grow in this particular urban area that can come from the master plans. Whereas after getting those data, when we run a transport demand model, we run certain policies and then we do optimization of the land use to achieve our mobility goals, we can also give this input back to the master plan so that master plans could be improved. So future land use determination using CMPs could be also taken up, which could be a part of the uh, development plan or master plan. So this is how a CMP and a development plan is connected. And previously we use, also used to have city development plans. So city development plans were very broad documents and where they focus mostly on infrastructure. CMPs definitely focuses on mobility that is improving the particularly the not the only the infrastructure part but also we are taking into account the people travel behavior and so many other things so overall the mobility improves in the city and then uh, in uh, terms of the comprehensive traffic and transportation studies these are projects based on transportation which are mostly concerned with vehicular flows in certain corridors again in cmps we look into the mobility wins we not only focus on tra vehicle flows we focal focus on the overall the land use, transportation and the other impacts that happen in an urban area. So looking at comprehensive mobility plans, uh, of similar to development plans, we also do have an objective and also we, form, we have a vision. That means we need to have a vision that we need to achieve for a particular urban area. Uh, for example, for a particular urban area, we can have a vision like, okay, within a certain time period, we would be able to achieve so much amount of people using non-motorized transportation. So this could be a sort of a vision which could be then broken down into smaller objectives which are which then we can do several, we can undertake several policies or several you know infrastructure development which can help us to achieve those objectives. And then the time frame for this uh, plan could be for, for 30 year period whereas uh, there would be review at the end of every five years so so that certain things could be updated maybe certain exogenous inputs for example the amount of new jobs coming to the urban area those kind of targets could be updated and the planning area also could change during that particular time period and along with this too we also required to develop the city profile the land use pattern and the population densities for different parts of the city so these are the initial data that we require or the different maps that we need to form uh, as you can see on the uh, on the other side you see the map for hyderabad metropolitan area and this includes there are two boundaries to it the blue boundary is basically H hmda which is hyderabad metropolitan development authority's boundary and this one and then the other one which is inside over here this one is the municipal corporation boundary. So these are two boundaries and as you can see, we can also execute our transportation or CM comprehensive mobility plan for both the inner area or for the entire area. So as you can understand trips, because it's a metropolitan area, what it means is the um, people living even in regions like this, they also may go over here to work. So that means we need to take care of the transportation issues or mobility issues that arise for people traveling from different parts of the city traveling to other parts of the city or even to the central area. So we cannot ignore the surrounding area even though development in those particular area may be sparse. Means for example this area may have been developed 
this area may have been developed but in a inner radius may be empty so we cannot uh, ignore those particular areas we need to take into consideration all the different areas and but that is again depends on us what should be our the in our objectives and vision we should decide what amount of area we should take while undertaking the planning exercise so once we know uh, once we decide on the uh, the extent of the area for which we will plan we need to understand the growth directions of the city that means in which direction the city is growing accordingly we can also set up the planning area for example if the city is growing along this particular area because there are two highways over here so we can say that in future this area will grow so i can also think of extending my or deciding my planning area based on this as well we can uh, take the ex uh, existing administrative boundaries or we can also increase the boundary so we can take in the new development areas we can take in the future growth uh, so we also need to predict the future growth pattern that means how the city is going to grow and the land use patterns for this particular city and that becomes part of the comprehensive mobility planning exercise so next once we decide on the overall planning area what we need to do is we need to break the entire urban area into different small zones now why we need to do that because it depends on many there are a lot of reasons why we do that but the primary reason is to so that these zones are homogeneous that means for this particular zone we will say that people tra living in this particular zone will have same options and they will experience similar kind of surroundings we or accessibility which will influence their choices that means the zones are primarily determined on similarity of land use similarity of ac uh, accessibility and this kind of parameters and when we actually execute the zones or we actually determine what should be the size of the zones we also look into other things for example look into the uh, uh, look into the different administrative existing administrative boundaries and so on so more or less large tz size results in lot of intrazonal trips so if i make the uh, tz size larger then it will result in lot of trips moving in between themselves so that is one problem so usually we need to understand how trips move from one zone to another so if lot of trips are inside then it it is some to some extent difficult to predict what should be the choices within that particular zone so this is one and then uh, there is another concept which is called a concept of cordon line that means at the end of the day we have to limit our study to a certain boundary and a cordon line helps us to do that and that cordon line also helps us to decide on the different types of zones for example for the central area of hyderabad like the municipal area the zone sizes could be a smaller because there the density is high and there the administrative boundary is also different for example there are wards so there we can have smaller size zones whereas for the outer area where the where we have you know sparse development where there we can have larger size zones so this could be one of the criteria for deciding on the tz sizes and also deciding on the kind of cordon line for example this is my boundary so and these are the highways that goes out of my planning area so and most of the people coming from outside the boundary come along those highways and then come and walk and go to the either the central court or they may even come and walk in this particular area so we need to have a cordon point over here to decide how many people are entering from outside the city into the urban area so that is why we require a cordon line and when we have a cordon line we can also have something called external zones like over here we can have you know if we say this are this is the surrounding area of the city then this becomes external to my planning area and then this becomes a external zone and we can broadly say that so many people are traveling from this particular zone to the different smaller zone inside the city area so this is a much larger zone that we take so this is a external zone and as you understand we cannot keep on uh, developing the plan for a huge area so that's why we limit the size of the the actual transportation plan and everything else outside could be taken as an external zone and we can break it as one big zone for the city but it's better to divide this into four five zones so that each zone contributes to the traffic to the the nearby highway 
or the state highway or the national highway which takes the traffic back into the city. So population of and similarly population of external zones are also surveyed but sample size is much much lower compared to the samples that we collect in the inner part of the city. So in this image you can see the different TSZs that has been adopted in this particular study. This is a recent study completed by the Hyderabad metropolitan area. So you can take a look at the TSZs and you can see the TSZ size vary. The central area has got smaller TSZs where the larger area has got larger TSZs. And to summarize we can say TSZs are, de are, are determined based on administrative boundary, physical barriers, road network and public transit network homogeneity in land use, special traffic generators and so on. Now what it means is whenever there is uh, a particular zone, for example this particular TSZ. So we will estimate the total number of people living there, we will estimate the total number of households staying there, we can also estimate the different kinds of households over there and each of these households will make trips and we need to say that okay how these people travel from this zone to all the other zones. So that basically means that these people, these households or these individuals will get the same choices in like in the, the transportation choices that are available to them would be all same. That means over here they get bus transit. So all of these particular trips would be assigned to a particular bus stop or to a particular railway stop. So that is why this TSZ becomes very, very important in the planning process. And accordingly, based on the location of bus stops or the public transit network and following existing urban bound, uh, administrative boundaries because the census data and other data which are available are primarily based on the administrative boundaries. So accordingly, we will make the TSZs which are becomes the, the primary area based on which we conduct our analysis. So now for each TSZ, when we are uh, developing a comprehensive mobility plan, there are certain tasks which are mandatory. That means these are part of the terms of reference set by the government of India. That means when when we execute a comprehensive mobility plan, and these are the and this is the document which should be used by the government to evaluate any plan that you propose or any infrastructure or any project that you propose. And using this, they will also uh, the government will also release funds for development. So that's why this becomes very, very important and that's why there are certain terms of references or certain things that needs to be followed while preparing these plans. So for example, for each TSZ, we need to know how many population, households and as per different income categories for each of these TSZs. Now how do we determine income categories? Even though we know the number of populations and households based on census data, it is very difficult to get income data. So here probably household assets or per capita floor area available in that area can act as an indicator for that kind of income bracket this particular household belongs to. So this is a indicator which is a proxy for actual income categories that could be there in this particular TSZ. Then we have percentage of land under different land uses. So we need to know detailed land use categories. From, a pre from the previous lecture, you remember there were 42 land use categories. So here we need to understand those land use categories for each of these TSZs. Then we need to understand the residential density and the job density for this particular uh, TSZ. That means how many number of jobs are there and so on. We need to understand the floor space index for this particular uh, TSZ. Again, floor space index may be different in different, different, uh, along different roads or different areas but when we are generalizing it as a TSZ, we have to adopt a uniform value which would be applied for the entire TSZ. So the floor space index needs to be known and we need to also understand the floor space use per activity and the building use. So uh, once this data is there, then the next step is to understand or rather review and collect data using both primary service and secondary you know using or uh, getting the data from secondary sources for different transportation systems which includes the different modes services and infrastructure that are available we should have detailed information about the road widths the kind of uh, the location of uh, you know, bridges we should know which are the public transit corridors which are the location of bus stops 
where are the uh, pub, uh, where are the paratransit routes and all these different data also is required when you create a comprehensive mobility plan and finally when we have this basic data set we need to conduct a travel behavior survey which means we have to do go from household to household and then conduct surveys of not a single person but all members of the family so that means whenever we survey a household all members the travel patterns of all members need to be understood and we need to understand the different socioeconomic groups and what kind of trips they make and what and we can understand both not only the trips but also the tours or the activity pattern that they undertake for example when you go for to your office and then go to a shopping and then come back from your office that's becomes a tour so a person usually takes his car and uses the car for all the three trips so instead along with the trip which actually measures from a origin and a destination we can also keep record of the tour that is being conducted and similarly we can also look at the activity pattern for that particular person all throughout the day because land use is related with activity that means different kinds of land uses results in different kinds of activity and that if it is recorded that activity leads to different kinds of trips or tours that are undertaken so along with this household survey which is which sometimes we call a travel diary as well which will be di discussed in detail in a later uh, lecture we also can do different kind of service which relates with people's perception of various modes of transport and primarily we see that time cost comfort safety and security these are the primary attributes which needs to be considered while people when we define choices for different modes in an urban area or a transportation system so this is again part of the terms of reference so that means uh, while time and cost could be got we, we can get them from the uh, secondary data sources comfort safety and security you we have to survey people and to get their perception to understand what kind of comfort or safety and security these people perceive for certain particular bus routes or a particular transportation service and then uh, regarding the number of surveys or uh, how for how household service that needs to be conducted so you in the uh, comprehensive mobility plan it is listed as 1 to 2% of the population depending on city size uh, considering the indian scenario this is very very important because in india the we our cities are very very densely populated so if i uh, if i try to maintain the uh, a higher percentage then it will result in very very large cost or amount of money that we will spend will be huge so that's why to limit the cost and also the time for doing a survey only 1 to 2% of population is considered but in a, again in a in a you know future lecture we will discuss about the surveying techniques sample sizes and so on which could be undertaken for smaller transportation projects and and other kinds of transportation service so once we have done our household survey and we also need to have information about the energy emission and the environment of that urban area we need to understand the service level benchmarks for that particular urban area and what kind of improvement that could be achieved while we you know propose uh, through our plans so that means improvement in public transit improvement in non motorized transportation improvement in its improvement in speed parking safety parking safety pollution integrated land use transport system all this there are standards and benchmarks for all this which has to be also we, uh, the plan should also definitely show how this factors have been improved in in our future plan or after we execute our comprehensive mobility plan so once this uh, uh, points are taken care of we need to develop scenarios that means we need to model or we need to decide how the urban area is going to grow over a period of time and after a period of time we need to do we need to understand what happens at in different scenarios so the first scenario is of course business as usual that means if nothing special is done to the urban area we do no special uh, infrastructure development no special change in the public transport system in that case what should be the effect of the existing infrastructure or how the existing transportation transportation system will evolve for that particular urban area transportation as well as land use system and that is the business as usual scenario and for that we need to do socio economic projections for each 
uh, TAZs. That means for each travel analysis, traffic analysis zones, we need to say how many new population will come into that area, what should be their, any change in their jobs they hold, any change in uh, the pattern of uh, the, uh, the household sizes, and all these things should be ascertained. Then we need to determine the economic transitions. That means, should a new industry is, uh, if a new industry is going to come, if jobs are being created for, for that particular industry, and then demographic transitions, that means new jobs uh, attracting more people to migrate from the rural areas, natural growth of that particular city, then based on that, uh, uh, what should be the change in family size, age, gender, and so on, employment projections, and land use uh, transitions, that will happen along with that. Now, land, uh, when we talk about land use transitions, uh, <coughs> We, uh, it's, it's, uh, it could be both natural as well as organic. We will discuss about that later. But how much and what kind of land use change will happen? How much vacant land will be built upon? And change in land use from one type to another. So these are the three things that we need to understand for an urban area. And once we do that, the next step would be to determine allocation of residential and non-residential land use what it means is for residences we need to allocate people to stay in certain new houses so that will bring up kind certain number of people to a particular tz or a new area so this allocation process also needs to be modeled and then finally the technology transitions which involve you know new modes new growth new uh, new areas uh, to be defined all the different issues that crop out of new technologies that are coming into place so these are the things that we need to understand and once this is done, or once we complete our projections for over here, once we complete our socioeconomic uh, projections and we know how the city is going to go over time, how the jobs are going to change, how the demographic pattern is going to change, how the land use is going to change, then in the next step, we need to conduct our travel demand analysis. And usually, uh, we could do travel de uh, demand analysis in different ways. Uh, but the classic example is of course the four stage transport model and as per the tor or the terms of reference of a cmp we are supposed to de develop a four stage model which in includes trip generation trip distribution modal split and trip assignment so these are the four steps of the transportation planning process so uh, i will get into detail of that but we need to first develop this model and we need to calibrate it using the base year data. What it means is we collect data from household service, we collect data from secondary sources. Using this data, we have to build the model and then we have to run the model and see how much it matches with the existing traffic patterns on the roads, how much traffic flows on the road, and then we have to modify the model till the point when the prediction of the model and the outcome or the outcome of the model the prediction of the model and the actual in the actual road the traffic flow and all matches to a certain extent when this happens we say the model is calibrated and when the model is being calibrated we can for, use it for future years for also prediction and this is uh, done for uh, including and when we develop the model it includes the socioeconomic attributes the employment attributes the land use changes the travel behavior of people, all these things are incorporated in this four-stage model. And usually the model is for a single destination. And but it's for that means we predict trips for one single destination from one TZ, it will move to another TZ. And it is for separate purposes. That means each trip is for a particular purpose. It could be like a walk trip, or it could be a recreation trip, or it could be a school trip or it could be a return to home trip, either from work, or it could be a non-home based trip. For example, a person going from office for a meeting is a non-home based trip. So all these separate trip purposes will have to be looked into. And this is modeled for each purpose. We will, we will uh, for each trip, we will say that how the trip would be distributed and then what sort of modal choices will be taken for that particular trip and so on. And all the four steps are sequential and the input from one step is taken as the, the output from one step is taken as the input for the next step. So in the trip generation model, uh, this includes both the trip production and the attraction model for each TZ. 
and what it uh, does is for trip production the total number of trips produced for a particular trip purpose for each how different kinds of households or individuals could be uh, predicted and then also the number of trips attracted to each zone so the number of trips attracted to each zone depends on the kind of trip it's if it's a walk trip it depends on the kind of uh, business uh, or retail or offices that are there in that particular neighborhood or the number of jobs that are there in the neighborhood if it's a school trip it depends on the number of institutions or schools or colleges that are there in that particular uh, tz so all this de determines the number of trips attracted to a particular zone so this is the first model which is the trip generation model then in the trip distribution model we allocate these trips between origins and destinations that means each trip needs to be put sent to a particular destination or we need to determine which trip goes to which destination that means from a particular tz a group we if a tz is producing 100 trips and out of that 100 trips 20 trips are walk trips we need to determine each of this walk trip is going to which zone. So using certain models, we can also do that. So this is trip distribution and it has to be done for each type of trip purpose separately. And then for each trip, we also need to determine what is the most likely travel mode and the total interzonal travel volume. That means how many once we determine how many people travel from one zone to another, so we can also determine what sort of mode that person will choose and that is the modal split model and finally we have trip assignment so once we know the trip that interzonal trip that means from which zone it start and which zone it goes we also know the mode the next step is to determine along which route or along which corridor or along which path the mode this particular person will travel so that is and based on that we will assign the trip to that particular path and when we assign that trip to a particular path, this will be done for all particular trips and this will lead to a certain amount of flow in a particular corridor, which can be matched with actual flow in the real corridors while we calibrate the model. And this is where we also get a feedback that, okay, when too many number of trips are assigned to a corridor, it may actually increase travel times, which may even change the modal choice or it, it may even change the trip generation process. So that is the more or less a basic brief description of the four stage model and we will, detail, we will describe this in detail in each of these stages in detail in later lectures. So <coughs> there are a few tasks that we should also uh, talk, there is one major task that is also listed in the TOR is the peak hour in this particular four stage model would be designed for peak hour periods and not for daily demand that means it is not going to predict for the entire day it is only going to predict the trip choices or the route assignments for only the peak hour so that this is this will take care of the maximum load that will come to the infrastructure that means along during certain times of the day during peak hours the transit system would be loaded the road network would be loaded and if we can predict that automatically the non peak hours would be taken care of but but if I consider the current new modes that are coming into place, that, are, that is like, like uh, for example, shared mobility, where we have uh, cabs which ferry passengers based on the request, they, uh, based on their request that they send from the mobile phones, there the, both the supply and the demand vary throughout the day. That means the number of people driving for this particular cab companies, that also varies throughout the day and the number of people wishing to use this uh, mode also varies throughout the day and accordingly the supply and demand needs to be managed. So this is where a full daily demand model is required or suppose a company gives its employees to work from home. So in that case what they do is they will actually shift their travel from the peak hour to a non-peak hour or they may even cancel their travel. So if I don't know the full daily demand of trips then we will not be able to predict this and then <coughs> Public transit, if it is planned for peak hour mobility, then of course it will it will be designed for the maximum load, but that means also certain buses and other infrastructure will remain idle all throughout the day. So that will lead to inefficiency. So instead, if I want to plan for demand responsive transit or rather providing buses as per the requirement and then we can share the buses between different routes, then that probably Im improves the overall transit experience. So this 
kind of problems will crop up if we don't do a full daily demand model, which could be also taken up in plans that, uh, in, could, be, that could be undertaken in future. So nowadays also because of Google, uh, in, uh, because of open source information such as Google traffic, people are also able to see the real time situations on certain road networks and accordingly they can also defer their travel time and all. So this kind of feedbacks are not com considered in the uh, comprehensive mobility plan but could be considered in future. So when we do a comprehensive mobility plan, and uh, we also do scenario analysis. So once we are, predict we are predicting that, okay, what kind of traffic will be generated in the business an analysis, uh, business as usual scenario, then we also need to determine some alternative scenarios which would be actually resulting in some sustainable transportation, uh, both uh, sustainable transportation services or sustainable transportation networks and overall this transportation system would be sustainable. So what could be this scenario? Some of the scenarios listed in the comprehensive mobility plan are limiting private vehicle ownership and use. That means we should target to limit the use of private vehicles. We should try to improve the urban form. As you remember, if you improve the urban form that may reduce in the use of gasoline and also use increase the use of non-motorized infrastructure then uh, we can uh, consider that uh, the different regulatory and financial measures, that means we can also introduce certain pricing policies for certain kind of services, which we can see how it is you know, going to affect that particular transportation system. We can go for high density mixed use development. We can close the city centers for car traffic. We can use paratransit as feeders to transit system and prevent the use of cars then transit oriented development. So these are the different scenarios that we can build for an urban area, which could be also tested using a comprehensive mobility plan or rather a travel demand model that we develop in the comprehensive mobility plan. So I will, uh, so these are some of the components that we need to deliver in a comprehensive mobility plan. This is again mandatory requirements like uh, integrated land use and urban mobility plan, public transport improvement plan, road network development plan, non-motorized facility improvement plan, freight movement plan, mobility management measures. And along with that, we can also, we need to provide the fiscal measures, implementation programs, prioritization projects, funding sources, and of course, monitoring of the implementation of this particular plan. So these are the different components which we need to deliver along with the overall models and the outcome of the models that are uh, based on the outcome of the models or the scenarios, we need to prepare these different plans and we need to deliver this as a part of the CMP. Uh, one small thing that is uh, for large cities, we need to develop the CMP as we have described. Uh, for example, pop uh, cities with a population more than 0.5 million, we need to do full CMP. Whereas for cities which are less than 0.5 million, million they are neither they have the financial resources to execute our CMP as we have discussed or neither they require that because usually you don't find a public transit network in a smaller city. You will find most of the people using bicycle or you know walking. So they don't require certain things. And so we don't need to go for a detailed computer based model for a small city. And we need to uh, follow our indicator based approach. And we need to determine the future travel demand based on the total trips generated from each zone and the total trip lengths. And we can use the existing percentage and we can project them using standard you know, increase of those particular percentage or decrease as per the requirement. And finally, CO2 emission and air quality dispersion modeling is also optional for these smaller cities. So that actually ends our the different requirements of a CMP. So these are the two documents that you can study. One is the toolkit, which helps in prepare, helps, which will help you in preparing a comprehensive mobility plan, and also the terms of reference for preparation of a comprehensive mobility plan. So, in conclusion, we can conclude this particular lecture by saying the aim of a comprehensive plan is to improve mobility of both people and goods through integrated land use transportation planning. This is the first. Second, land use demographic, economic and technology transition also needs to be predicted for an urban area so that we can assess its impact on the travel demand and travel behavior. 
And finally, travel demand and travel behavior is determined using the traditional four-step transportation model. So these are the three primary conclusions or for this particular lecture and using this you can following this you can develop comprehensive mobility plans for future urban areas thank you